What's going on, guys? My name is Tanner Katowski, and this is Steve Katowski, and we are hosting the What's Up Dog cast. We are from What's Up Dog and Armored Canine in Miramar Beach in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. Here today, we are with Calm Canine with Meredith uh, down in Orlando, Florida. Um, how are you guys doing? Doing good. How are you? I am good. Doing good. Busy, good. busy, busy. Good That's always good. Yeah. So what you were telling me the other day um, was that you guys focus more are going to focus more on reactive dogs uh, uh, more than just basic obedience and things like that. Um, we're going to act uh, uh, and actually talk about a lot of the reactiveness with dogs um, versus unpredictability, um, genetics versus fear and things like that today. Um, and so I'm excited about it. Um, and I'm sure dad has something to say too. Yeah, it's good to see you. It's been a while since I've actually seen your face. Um, I know. Keep threatening a trip up here, but I haven't seen you yet. So <laughs> I can't get away. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk about what you guys are doing uh, and and kind of some things that mesh with us for people that are uh, watching uh, uh, that that don't know. Uh, I make no bones about referring people to the Calm Canine. Um, and I've done that uh, a lot over the years and, uh, uh it's going to be a, a lot of fun talking with, uh, Meredith and, uh, what they're doing down there. So this, this should be fun. Yeah. And, and that's a big thing with us is we, we obviously train a lot of the similar way, um, as each other, we use a lot of the psychology with dogs rather than just using aversion therapy, um, which is a lot of fun. Um, and, and it's a, a lot about where the dog is at and what we can get the dog to do. Right. Um, and part of that again is genetics versus, uh, versus fear. Um, oh, and, yes. and this is a big thing that I personally have dealt with in, in, in recent times. Um, but dealing with a lot of reactive dogs as a, I mean, in the last what two years, we've got a lot because of what we call COVID dogs. Um, a lot of it's based off of fear. And so my first question to you is, what can, in your opinion, and what have you guys seen down in Orlando, what causes the reactivity that you guys see quite a bit? It's the COVID dogs, the um, mentality that they don't go out and do socialization and have positive imprinting as a young pup. Right. They coddle them in the wrong scenarios. And so you, and inadvertently, they are training their dog to be nervous right. and to associate them with being nervous because it just times are different right now you know you see people that are more you know anxious and that and it, it feeds into the household it feeds into the dogs the dogs are the most sensitive member in the house right and they are the the i guess the pillars or should i say the example of body language and reading body language right you know they they are taking on all of our worries. And then when they're nervous to make us feel better, we coddle them or reward them at the wrong times. And I feel like that mixed in without seeing a trash can, you know, truck go by or a school bus or, you know, things like that, that even the simplest things, dogs are reacting to, you know, 75% yep. of the time now that I didn't see five years ago. Right. And I think just that combination is just the perfect recipe for the worst storm. <laughs> right. Sure. Sure. So like with the dogs that are, uh, uh, I'll say this the right way. Uh, so that I lead into it, right. Like a lack of socialization, um, mm -hmm. that becomes the big buzzword now. Well, we socialized our dog. We had other dog friends and we had a lot of people around, but that's not socialization. Um, no. That is uh, friend making, and and that's not the same as socialization. And we're seeing a lot now, which I, I think is great. We're seeing a lot of posts say on Facebook where this is what social socialization, what you think it is, and this is what it really is, right? Yeah. Exposure work, um, exposure to noises, surfaces, different environments, and all that. And that's what people didn't get uh, with their dogs because they didn't go out. Um, and, and there's things that they do at home uh, or they could do at home and they forego those things because they've taken the old, well, there's a lot of people around, so they should be well socialized or we have two other dogs they are well socialized with other dogs, um, but they're not getting the environmental stimulus. They're not no. getting exposure uh, to any of those things. Um, how do you see that play in uh, with I think with with breaking uh, the mold with the dog owners because they were taught what socialization kind of was, but it's really yeah. not. How how are you seeing that, and how are you breaking through with that? 
Well, I, I want to go back and I think that socialization starts with the right, I'm, I'm going to get slack for this, but the right breeding, you know, sure. because if you get the right breeder, they do the imprinting correctly. They socialize them in the correct manner when they're young, which helps the transition into a human home. Yeah. So, you know, it, whether you think it's a backyard breeder, just figure out like what they have done to set your puppy up for success, Right. you know? And then, so when, for me, I guess the biggest breakthrough is actually just educating the owners because the ones that we get are the ones that are fed up. They're ready. I, probably once every other month, we get the call from animal control. They're sitting in the parking lot, turning their dog in, or they're sitting in the parking lot to euthanize their dog. That's 11 months old because they can't take the dog outside, you know? Um, so I think it's education as far as setting up realistic expectations yep. for what to expect from your dog and then holding them accountable for their actions for kind of enabling that behavior. Right. And I think that's a big thing that we see a lot is, is almost everybody that, that I deal with is, is almost enabling behaviors that, they're like, well, I want to fix this. We'll stop letting it happen. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's the one thing I tell people. And I actually, the appointment I was late for this because of, it's the one thing I kept repeating myself, stop letting it happen. If she's stepping in front of you is because she thinks that she can be in front of you. If you want her behind you, you have to make her be behind you. Right. Um, and, and that's one thing that people simply don't get a lot of the times is, how do we fix this behavior? Well, don't let it happen, right? Um, in, in the first place, don't let them fail um, in the first place and you'll see more success naturally without having to ask them to do anything. Um, and, and that's what we see a lot with a lot of the reactive dogs. For instance, I get with board and trains. Um, I'll have a dog that has territorial aggression where in that three weeks that it's with us or five weeks that it's with us, that pen it's in is now its own. And so when another dog goes near that pen, they get mad at it. And, and that's when we can actually help fix that. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and then we have dogs that go home and they're amazing here with their obedience and everything like that. And then mom and dad don't go work them. Like I asked them to at home. And now we're reverting back to everything we just had to fix. Um, and it's a lot about, again, educating them, but it's not just about educating them on our parts, but it's also partially on them to, to, actually go and act everything yeah. right and, well, and that's a big thing and that's the i think that's the biggest thing we see when dogs fail here um is when it's when the people don't do what we asked when they're not emulating the trainer it's himself or herself um when that happens is when the dogs aren't the way they want um and if it if i can grab the leash and the dog listens to me right away Obviously, something is different about respect between me and that dog. But now when I go crazy for the dog, it's still hyper and excited for me yep. because it, I've created a relationship with the dog to where it wants to be with me because I've given it structure. Um, and I think that's where people fall off a lot of the times. Um, and, and that's just the simple fact of it. Um, speaking on the COVID dogs, um, our good friend, Eric uh, Stambro, he was talking on our last podcast about, and he made a kind of a funny analogy to it. And I use it a lot in training now is, what happened a year and a half ago is what people were doing for a year was sitting on the couch, petting their dog, watching Tiger King. Now they're going back to work. They're having to go back on site. And now their dog is ripping up their couches and furniture and peeing all over the house, pooping all over the house because they're crazy anxious because, oh, mom and dad aren't here to touch me anymore. Yes. And, you know, and then I also find that humans... I say humans, <laughs> but humans we tend to have the separate separation anxiety from their dogs. Yes. So when they come home, it's, oh my God, it's been so terrible. I've missed you. And then all this is just put onto the dog. And then there's no, you know, structure. There's no leadership in that. Right. And right. I think, that, you know, dog training to me is 25% dog and 75% human. I think it's they 90, have yeah. To, yeah. That's yeah. what we always say is 90, 10, honestly. It really is. But you know, human error, I'm going to say, seven, you know, but if you train the dog and you do the 90, 10 for six months, a hundred percent, you know, consistent, you don't have to be, you know, harsh, you know, or anything right. with this dog, because it's a relationship that has been foundationally built on trust and leadership. And so I think that that's where people I see fail. They'll come to training and the dog does great for us. They go home. They might do good for a day, 
at two days, you know, but then this little slips, you know, someone's late for ball practice or, you know, company came over unexpected and they get out of that habit so quick and they forget that it's them that's in training now. The dog's been through the training. Exactly. They have to put that work in and the success of the dog is only, you know, dependent on the handler. Right. So I tell Every people I'm building them a toolbox um, mm -hmm. by imprinting behaviors. Now you have a toolbox. You have to open the toolbox and use the right tool at the right time yes. so that it fits the job. And that could be as simple as waiting for the door to go outside, um, sitting, waiting, you know, for their food. Um, uh, it, it doesn't matter what it is, you know, company comes over, have the dog on a place, uh, mm -hmm. rather than allowing it to just free run and, and roam. Sure. We want the dog to be able to see your company and all that. That's fine, but let's give it five or 10 minutes to relax and calm down exactly. and get its, you know, bearings about it and, it and its brain about it that, Hey, this is not, you know, this is not my play toy. And, and that becomes, I, I think my big thing is I, I tell people, I'm going to build you a toolbox. Now you have to start using the tools correctly. My brother was a builder and he used to always say, you have to use the right tool for the job. And yeah. um, uh, when you use the right tool, everything goes better and you don't have do overs. Um, uh, I had a, a room in the house that we converted into a nursery for puppies. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I had my wife's uh, father-in-law come over and our father-in-law stepfather come over my father-in-law and uh, uh, he says yeah we can we can do this flooring in no time and I said that's great I've got this saw set up in the garage and all the stuff and he looked at me kind of funny he said we don't need a saw for a while and I said but we're laying all this plank flooring and all this stuff and he said no he brought in a tool it's a break and uh, he laid the flooring in the room in an hour and I would have, you know, I would, it was the right tool for the job. We never left the room until we got to some final weird angles that we had to use the saw for and he had everything laid. And it really, for me, it got in my head the way that I think in pictures and it's the right tool for the job. And yeah. our job was very, very, very easy. He brought the right tools, used the right tools. And we had this, uh, our, our new nursery room finished in, in really no time flat and very impressive. It, it, that goes to everything that we do in life and dog training is no different. Use the right tool. And when people think of tools, all they think about is equipment, but it's not just equipment. It's the tools of the training. What yeah. has been imprinted? What relationship have you yep. built? Um, and uh, what can your dog do every day? And, and Mayor, one of my favorites is when you bring grocery bags in, have your dog go lay down while you put away groceries. Yes. Um, teach the dog that when you walk in with groceries, it needs to go lay down and watch you put away groceries instead of getting in your business. And the same applies when you're when you go in the kitchen to cook. Have your dog go lie down. Yes. And yes. watch you cook and not sniff the floor and get in your way and make you spill a pot. And people don't think about that until it actually happens or they'll have a remembrance of a time that it did happen. Oh, that would be wonderful if we, if my dog would just do that. Well, it will take the tool out of the toolbox, ask the dog to lay down and people don't think about doing it in everyday life. And I think that, that the way that we train similarly is, yeah. is empowering people to do things just like that so they can live with their dog. Um, that I think is kind of the crux of your business. You know, uh, it's your model. It, it is because it's about the lifestyle. You can have all the training you want. You know, I could have a $30,000 dog here, but if I don't implement it and have him included in my life and have that relationship and set those simple expectations, which is that that's the structure we're looking for. When dog trainers say structure, it's, it's just a consistent expectation of not being rude just behave. You know, we don't let our kids be rude. We don't, you know, we shouldn't let our dogs. So it's rude, you know, cooking has nothing to do with the dog unless you're feeding them table scraps or, you know, something like that. So you wouldn't consult your dog to send an email, but you would expect him to, you know, lay still or, you know, be patient while you're sending it, you know, don't be rude. Don't be pushy. Don't be dropping the ball and 
my lap, you know, those types of things. Well, you're not going to let a toddler come up and smack you with their Barbie doll. If you and don't stop it, I will. Right. And that's where a lot of reactivity comes from is that they, people miss the little nuances like in the home, just kind of like that philosophy, you know, well, my dog doesn't like kids. Well, kids are scary because they, they wobble, they make weird noises, they smell different and they're just unpredictable. So of course a dog doesn't want that kid in their bubble, whether they've been good with that kid a hundred times or not, they're going to finally be like, look, you haven't stopped this kid from pulling my ear. I'm going to have to. And right. then that, that dog deemed dangerous, but it's, it's just like, kind of failure of setting that dog up. You set that yeah. dog up to fail. Absolutely. And, and that's where reactivity stems from, is just as much human error from imprinting to training, setting the dog up with structure, expectations, putting leadership before snuggles. And, all. and we're not saying that. We're saying that once the dog learns how to slow down and process, you can bring the excitement back up. You can bring you know, different drives out of the dog, but first the dog has to learn how to process stuff. Yep. And, yeah. you know, in different, where we're different is that you do like a lot of protection and things like that. And what people don't know is that I got my first dog from you and that's how we met. And, you know, that just getting that dog from you really showed me the difference in genetics. Sure. Because when I got Nico, I didn't have to go train with Nico like 20 hours a week or right. you know things like that. He was just a natural, well-balanced dog that can turn it on and you know, a drop of a hat. Right. You couldn't ask for anything better. He could go from crazy to just being calm just instantly. Right. You know, he just that was that dog. But then you can go look at other dogs in that that are genetically wired wrong. And that's a different type of reactivity. That's something that isn't fixable. It's not trainable. It's right. managed. Right. And that's that's the difference what people aren't seeing and understanding is what is that difference? Well, I think that that becomes the problem too is where people want a fix. When you mention management, mm -hmm. they say, whoa, you mean you can't fix this? Everything's not fixable. Um, mm -hmm. and some of it is management and, and to me, that's what they owe the dog because they got the dog. Yep. Um, they, whether, whether they rescued it, adopted it, bought it, it doesn't matter. Right. they made <laughs> yeah. a commitment. Um, and then I will say there's some people that are not capable of managing certain yes. dogs. And the best thing they could possibly do is to relinquish that dog, um, because 100%. the dog's going to be a problem, right? Um, and we want to always advocate for the dog, which mm -hmm. means getting the dog placed differently, um, sometimes having to put it down even, and no one wants to hear that, you know, cause that's, you know, that, that's against all yeah. the good stuff. But, um, if the dog can't be managed properly, then the dog's going to do something bad and, um, that's going to be a problem. So I use, you know, I, I throw the word around liability all the time. Um, and it, it, it is a liability and, and the, we, we've seen it more so since COVID with, I will say single people and anxiety yep. and, and it just, they are so anxious nowadays. They should, they can't hardly take care of themselves let alone have that commitment to that dog. Right. You know, and, and that's the beauty. If you, if you really nurture a relationship with a dog, a dog is a mirror of you. And if you are nervous and anxious, your dog's going to be nervous and anxious. Yep. But if you see that in your dog, that should be a reminder that, okay, what's going on with me. And you can build a, a trusting, beautiful relationship like that. But most people want to coddle and feed that relationship. So then dogs become nervous and scared of everything because you're nervous and scared of everything. And it's just, I think that if we could switch people's, you know, thought processes of, you know, I can help fix my dog and not give up on my dog, but first I had to help me, you know, and look at me, hold myself accountable for, you know, how is our lifestyle, you know, because if your lifestyle has structure boundaries, 
you know, and we're not saying that your dog has to have a rigid, you know, lifestyle. Everyone thinks that you, you, to me, the idea of training that we hear of a lot is it's very rigid. I have to go six times a day outside for five minutes and the dog, you know, lives in the kennel and it can only come out to work. And I, that's, that's a working dog. If you know, that's a different type. We're talking about pet dogs, the yep. ones that we see get back in shelters, the ones that, you know, we see all the time that are, should be like a fluffy, happy, go lucky golden retriever is now scared to death of, you know, a leaf, a butterfly, something, you know, anything. Yep. So I think first, you know, it comes to accountability within yourself. If I'm taking on this older dog that didn't have the right imprints and all this stuff, am I going to be the one to help him through it? And no realistic expectations is it's a journey. It's not fixed. Right. It's not, we like to think of it as it's kind of like therapy, you know, mar marriage counseling, because it's two parties you can go and get all the tools and all the knowledge to help, but unless you're willing to put in the work, right. it's just not the right fit. Right. Well, you have the dog that wasn't good, say with its original owner. Mm -hmm. And now the second owner or third owner gets the dog. Um, they deal with all of that baggage, just like any mm -hmm. other relationship. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. The problem is, is the only way to get the dog to shed that baggage is to really increase trust. Um, mm -hmm. And that becomes a little bit, a little bit of a difficult, you know, place to get into. Uh, but when I tell people, and I, and I quit being shy about it, uh, they say, you know, well, my dog acts this way. It never acted this way before, and now it acts this way. And when I say, it tells me the dog doesn't trust you uh, mm -hmm. because you're walking by, and the dog is now freaking out um, because yep. another dog walked by or a human walked by. It doesn't trust you. And that's a hard pill to swallow. Um, yeah. But I quit holding back on that with people and letting them know. And then when they bring the dog in, well, can I bring the dog to see you? Sure. I'll take the leash and walk it around my store uh, with the daycare and people. And there's just a lot going on. And the dog's behaving and paying attention. Mm -hmm. and they say, what, I mean, are you a miracle worker? You know, <laughs> no. But what I did based on my body language, based on my communication, and there's some leash skill in that as well, right? Yeah. Um, that we can teach some of that to the right person. Um, yes. But the dog now pays attention to me and not the surroundings. Asking and that, to yes. take care of it to make sure yes. that it's safe. Yeah. And then when that same dog lays down and turns its back to the owner and faces me, and that means its back is to the rest of the world, they're amazed. That's where we get, and, and those reactive dogs that are manageable, that are fixable, mm -hmm. and we see that, and that's 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 a that's a big deal these days. And the ones that are not fixable, um, uh, where they're not going to act that way, th just take some, and, and and there's a midway point where there's a lot of unraveling that has to be done with that dog. That takes time, and it takes yes. effort. And that's where I see a lot of the people just want a quick fix. And yes. um, whether it's an equipment fix, well, can we just do this with a collar? Can we just do this with, you know, with, with this harness or something else? And they want a quick fix. And I don't have that answer. Um, and you'll get them to where people call, well, can you fix this problem? I, I, or how long is this going to take? My, mm -hmm. my new canned answer is I have no idea. I've not met your dog. Yeah. Um, and uh uh, then that usually they want something quick. They want it fast and easy. And honestly, people should stop owning dogs. Yeah. Oh, and you know, I guess that's into the tool thing. People want to throw money or tools at, at a dog, you know, and they think that if I throw a large amount of money into training, that I should get lassie when this dog, you know, comes home. Right. Correct. And that it's like a car and it's like a Ferrari. Oh, I got this new Ferrari because it's, you know, all souped up versus, you know, the car you sent in. I, I don't know. But it, that's not how it works it, at all. And I, the quick fix is the big problem. And so now we tell them we, we can't fix them. Whereas back in the day, you know, we would be like, yes, you know, except for those one percenters, you know, we can help. We can we can get you 75 percent there. But it, it's really dependent on the people. And it's just the same thing that you said. People are always like, 
well, can we get it? Why don't you get before and afters? And it's because unless we get you a, a video of you doing it with the dog, the moment we take the leash, it's different. It's just different. And the dog sense that because we're not being mean, we're not being pushy, we're not being overbearing, and we're not, we're just being leaders. Right. And it, they being feel it. Clear. The, yes. <laughs> being clear with it. We're not, and we don't have to assert ourselves or dominate ourselves to do that. We don't have to lure them and to trick them. It's just a dog knows, you know, those are all tools and things that you add on to a dog right. to get, you know, what you want later on and teach them and coach them and make it fun. But first and foremost, you can't get to any of those steps unless you are committed to being a leader for the dog. Right. Yeah. I think that's where we see a, a lot of the uh, one of two things, either the breaking point with the person or the breaking point with the dog is where uh, almost like a breakthrough, right? Um, will yeah. the person end up wanting to be that leader and, and have that structure with their dog or is the dog going to accept it? Um, again, I get a lot of strong... Uh, I'm going to be honest, a lot of strong female dogs that like to be pushier than a lot of the strong males. Um, and, and that's just a pretty much a pretty well-known fact yeah. of a lot of the dogs. Um, yeah. My dog's a good example of that. And I always bring that up in trainings is first day I gave Kendall, who is our, our back-end trainer, um, Andy's leash. She took her like a kite down the hallway. Um, but the first time I said, hey, Kendall, stop your feet and give her a correction. And she corrected her and she backpedaled looking at Kendall like this. And mm -hmm. looking right in her eyes and backpedaled and sat down with her. And she's like, okay, you're going to make me listen. I respect you now. But mm -hmm. with new people, she's like, I'm not going to listen until you respect me. But then they mm -hmm. hand the leash back to me, flips, a uh, switch flips again, and, yeah. and it's back to being normal. And I think that's where people honestly fall off. Are we going to be able to reach that breaking point with the dog, but also with the person? Because if I reach that, that threshold with the dog, of okay he every time he gets on leash with me or she gets on leash with me they're the most angelic dogs in the world but they know we're going to go play after we work but then the second i hand the dog back to the owner the owner's like well why is this dog doing this with me why are you sitting there letting it jump on you when i've already given you the tools to fix it and yeah. that's a big thing we see is are you going to be a leader not just for yourself, but with your dog as well, because that'll help with your everyday life. We tell yeah. a lot of people, you shouldn't have to live your life around your dog. You should be able to live your life with your dog. Um, exactly. That doesn't mean taking him to grocery stores and all this different stuff, but that means, hey, can I sit on the couch and my dog's not sitting there nosing me for a ball? Um, the, the, all the different things that if I leave my dog in my office, is it going to rip up the the tissue in, in the bathroom when it walks away? Or is it going to go and rip up my entire computer cord because he gets bored? No, because she knows that she's not allowed to and she knows I'm coming back. That's one thing about, again, like you said, with, with breeding a lot of the time is where are the genetics lying in the right place? Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, with breeding, you also you can have very well bred do well well bred dogs as far as yeah. beauty um, and, and structure and health. But what happens when you have that well bred dog that is unpredictable because yeah. something isn't clicking up here? You don't know what happens until all of their drives have now come out at two to two and a half years old. You may see a different dog than what you saw at eight weeks old when you bought it. Um, oh. And that's a big thing. And even with rescue dogs, um, I know a lot of people that, that have got dogs at eight weeks old, sometimes even younger than that, unfortunately, from rescues. And then at two years old, they're like, my dog started exhibiting behaviors almost overnight a month ago. I'm like, because it's developing new drives that you're not taking care of correctly. You're and not they're not equipped to take care right. of either because they're showing with all the studies now and you read them um that early neuter creates a problem with a two-year-old dog um oh, they dislike they other dogs just like humans all that um and that's you know that is incredibly problematic i want to ask you this though mary is the uh um when you you look at reactivity okay versus aggression because a lot of people oh. think oh my dog's aggressive it's actually yeah. least reactive um, so we'll separate out aggression. We look at reactivity. 
do you find that that is uh, tied into? Obviously, we know there's fear there, but part of the the root problem, the way that I see it, <clears throat> is that it's doing some resource guarding um, because it's had mom or dad uh, that baby them, coddle them, love on them, um, and <clears throat> somewhere along the line, they've learned a little growl, a little bark gives them what they want. Well, let's try that in an open forum now. Let's go out on the streets yeah. where we never did it before. Um, but now you're walking towards us. I growl, I bark, you, mm -hmm. the, the other person and dog leave. Uh, but it, do, it does it also, uh, in your experience, do you see the resource guarding in there building as part of that? It's definitely, I, I really, I think you can almost tell a dog that would be reactive if like someone like me and you could watch them grow up, right? Because there's certain things like, my first thing I always ask is, when did you get the puppy? Like, what age did you get the puppy? Because if they got them anything before eight weeks, I'm like, okay, we right. have some major work to do in just the first couple of weeks. Like when we do board and trains, we'll automatically almost ask for a week longer just because there's so much unwinding to do. But a lot of people will get puppies or dogs from, you know, with, I'll, I'll say shelters, rescues, they have the sad story. So their first interactions are, oh, it's either cute and look how cute it is. And they reward when it's actually jumping or pulling at the pant or, you know, things like that, or they coddle and nurture their rescue sad story rescue, every rescue dog was abused don't you know oh yeah oh and they were all bait dogs right mm -hmm. yeah. now we had you know there are bait dogs out there you know i'm we've run across one maybe two true ones in our in like our career right. but <laughs> every every rescue is a bait dog neglected abused you know but that's the By baggage man. By a man, they hate no, man. Or had a beard and a hat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We but get that yeah. oh, uh, quite a bit, and, and I'm going to lead into one more question, which is kind of an open-ended question for both y'all. Um, when when working and doing training, we're talking about management versus fixability, right? Obviously, with genetic issues, I would say probably what 99% cannot be fixed when it's a genetic issue, right? Um, and, it, and it's part of that unpredictability, right? They could be fine with a dog one second and, and for for six months, and then one day just snap um, with nothing triggering. And that, again, is part of that genetics. Um, but talking about management, what does that look like with a dog like that? Some people, you have to keep dogs in the household separate. Some dogs, you just have to have supervised uh, um, playtime, whatever it is. Um, what people, a lot of the times, the question I have is, well, people a lot of the times think, well, what if I just have them on two separate leashes while walking? How bad is that for their anxiety uh, when doing that? I don't recommend it. And the reason why is because whatever this anxiety, you know, management dog is feeling is feeding to the other dog. The other dog is going to become, a lot of people will call it litter mate syndrome, yep. you know, but it's, it's, you're feeding and teaching that dog bad habits. And because you can't fix this one, you, you can't fix this one, you know? So until to me, what it looks like is separate walks, you know, depending on the situation, it's, they can't be around each other. Yep. You know, it's, I I've seen dogs like that, that will break through glass doors to get to the other dog and they've been fine for a year, yep. you know? And so it's just though you it's realistic expectations as far as like this is how this dog is. We can be fine one on one if they don't have bones, if they don't have you know anything resource, you feed them in the kennel, you know, depends on the situation. But it's just, I think people, you know, like, oh, well, they haven't you know had an issue in six months. Well, why push it? Right, why push exactly. it? why damage the relationship you have with both dogs medical they're going to get 10 times worse and then it's going to be another six months before your right. dog comes back to that step exactly so management to me is it's like having a special needs child you have to be committed for the life of this dog right. to do what this dog needs 
it's a different ball game. Yeah. And so one thing you, you can never um, set aside learned behavior um, because it, it may not be genetics or maybe some genetic predisposition, but you, you can't just set aside learned behavior because yep. if a dog learns that acting a certain way gets it what it's get it gets it what it wants, it's going to repeat that behavior. So the way that I define, um, sorry, something in my eye, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea behind the, the way you have the, I was going to say about defining a dog, um, uh, survival, uh, instinct, how do I get what I want? How do I stay safe? Um, and how do I get what I want is huge. Um, and if I learn that barking, growling, lunging gets me what I want, sometimes that's the human at the other end of the leash. Yeah. Everyone leaves you alone. Right. Um, and people forget what that looks like, but it could be, um, uh, something in the household with another, another dog. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, like you said, why push that? If you had six good months, why push it? Well, we just yeah. thought we could introduce a bone finally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, okay. wrong, absolutely wrong. Cool. Answer, yeah. You know, exactly. The other yeah. thing that you're talking about is like a dog on a leash. So you end up with an anxious dog and a, and, and a dog who's not anxious. Um, what people want is for the dog who's not anxious to teach the dog who is anxious how to behave. And that's yeah. a huge failure unless yeah. you have an incredibly strong, confident dog yep. that is doing that. Um, and I've done that with one of my dogs with Zeus many times. You do the same. You guys are a pack trainer. So you know what that looks like and you know what that means. Yep. But when people try to do that with the assumption, you know what, we're going to go get another dog, bring that dog home and hope it teaches this one it doesn't work because the leadership still isn't there right. that was missing with the first dog is now going to come into play with the second dog. And I think that's what people miss um, is it's the human input that yes. it has created a lot of the problems. And that's what we were saying at the very beginning, these COVID dogs, we, you know, the, the, the high anxiety dogs yep. and the trouble dogs. And mm -hmm. so it's still the same human input, but they thought because someone told them, Oh, you should get another dog. Mm-hmm. And so that's a huge problem that we see, yep. excuse me, that, that's, that's a huge problem that we see right now is people getting multiple dogs, hoping that other dog's going to teach the, the weak dog. Yeah. And, and that's the thing too, is like, like he said, you guys do the same thing. He's used Zeus. I use Indy probably on a, I would say four out of five days a week that I'm here. I use Indy um, because dogs pick up on her body language dogs pick up on our body language as well obviously but when dogs are reactive towards a strong dog like indy almost always i look at the whoever is on the leash and they're oh it's okay oh it, what they're doing at that point is garnering attention they're trying this is that's something else is is like when a dog is reactive on a walk they'll be like sit 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 and then when the dog finally sits good boy mm -hmm. and the dog to fixate and be good boy and so that's what they start to associate triggers with right that's great for the attack dog that's how you train an attack dog you frustrate them they Correct. start acting up <laughs> exactly, good boy, good exactly. Boy. frustration you know is the attack when that leash breaks or you know you, right. you release that dog so the dog has that and a lot of times they become reactive because we're inadvertently rewarding them at the wrong time. Yeah. And, you know, so it goes back to like, you can't, the difference between our dogs that, you know, we have and you have is that our dogs have been around hundreds, thousands of dogs right? and nothing bad has never ha has ever happened to them ever. My, my dogs can have like 180 pound great dane lunging at their face and they're like yeah whatever because they have trust exactly but it's the relationship and the leadership so people see people like us that can do it and we're doing it for training we're doing it to get something out of the dog to, you know see but people see that and they're like well you know i always see trainers use their demo dogs or you know and it's i i also see a lot of TikTok and Stuff like that, like recently on the rise. Well, 
TikTok, what you don't see are these dogs that have been spent thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours training, building relationships. And then they try to teach that to their dog. Well, they're trying to teach a nervous dog first and add excitement. Well, excitement drives anxiety. It just, it's like fuel to a fire. Yeah, absolutely. So you're holding the dog up, but the end of it, the difference between when we do it for training is that we calm the dog down. We end the exercise with the dog calm. And that's what people can't do. So, you know, they try to get that excitement at the wrong times on the walk, you know, or have, you know, get the other dog excited so that the dog can see that this dog's happy. It's just, right. it's the wrong information for the wrong training scenario. Exactly, because there's different types of anxiety. Some of it's from mm-hmm. place, wanting to play. Some of it's from wanting to even work. Some of it's from mm-hmm. fear, right? And, yeah. and with doing training in here, I mean, we deal with Malinois all the way to the, the doodles and everything in between. Yeah. Um, and, and you see the whole spectrum of that. I've seen doodles that will have more working anxiety because they want to go sniff the ground and find a ball. Mm-hmm. Then some Malinois that come and do basic obedience training with us. It's really neat to see, but every dog is different. And I think that's one thing that people honestly so, misperceive is that why is my dog like this? But I just saw, again, like you just said, I just saw this dog. It's the same exact breed. Why is it doing this? I had mm-hmm. somebody yesterday and we're doing training with her and she's, well, this breed is very adamant about doing this. I'm like, No, my mom has the same breed and she's the opposite. And they're like, well, why? Because I gave it structure. It's not about what the breed is necessarily. And sometimes it is. Obviously, there's different breeds that are more stubborn than others and uh, have different genetic things going on. But a lot of the time, it's, again, how the dog is raised from start to finish. Um, But then again, and I'm going to talk about this thing on TikTok real quick that you just said. So, a lot of those trainers, and I, I, I'm going to use a specific example. I don't know the person's name, but this dog was, and it was a Malinois, uh, and, and the girl looked at it and said, hey, kill. And the dog looked at the lady and spun circles around her. And she goes, and, and she looked in the camera. All you have to do is ignore the dog until it does it. This goes back to something that you just posted on your Instagram page. I think it was today. Um, what happens when you ignore that dog? You're, you're, you're negatively enforcing it because you're letting the anxiety build at that point. You have it in your, your Dutch's name is Kelso, right? Um, you have Kelso and you've had Nico. What happens with that? If you, fa- even with Nico, with how amazing of a dog he was yeah. with Indy, with blue, with Rick, with Zeus, if you were just to ignore the behaviors that they were doing as puppies, you have scars on you at this point, right? If you do that. I got Kelso too, you guys, because <laughs> exactly. I was like, I had Nico and then I got Kelso and at like 14, 16 weeks, he was biting. And it wasn't right. like, it wasn't the normal puppy bite drive. It was no, like. To bite. Yeah. And yeah, it was swap dogs actually <laughs> uh, in that period. What, and, and the thing is, though, is what happens with that when you don't, and, and people actually come to me all the time, well, I've ignored it or I've given it something else to do. What's the step they missed actually interrupting what they're doing and correcting what they're doing and then showing them, hey, but this is what you can do. You have yeah. to be fair, right? And, and that's where people fair. misconceive that. Yeah, and every dog is different. You have to be fair for the dog at the moment the situation and that dog so i can't expect kelso to do what nico did there's no way we can't put kelso in a pack of dogs but we nico was our like quickly number one male you know he he was the dog um so i think it's realistic expectations for that dog right and i think with dogs like that they hold you accountable you know, if you aren't involved, you have to be involved in what they're yeah. thinking. You have to be involved. You have to be so proactive. Right. And that's what people are. They're reactive. I'm proactive. You know, my dog, he needs exercise like no other dog I've ever had. Yeah, that's what you're telling me over the phone is you four miles when you guys don't get to walk him a lot or if it's raining or whatever. Yeah. You run four and miles on like, the treadmill. It, but he's still nuts like so it's a combination of like with him you know a lot of dogs you put them in place you teach them how to relax you know in 30 minutes they're like you know laid out kelso is still almost hyperventilating like 
let me go, 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 let me go. I got to work. I got to spin. I got to do something. But, you know, if we didn't have the dedication we did, he would be a very, very dangerous dog. Yeah. He, sure. it, you know, he, he is, he's redirected on me. He, you know, it's just that he's so nuts in those moments. If you don't fix them in those moments and be on top of it, a hundred percent, he, he's going to bite you. Yeah. And, and that's, that's who he, he's a management dog. Right. You know, we, we have to change our lives. He doesn't get to go out with the pack. We have to let him out separate, you know, because thresholds he'll turn around and redirect on someone. Right. So, you know, we have to put him on a leash, take him out. He's not the dog that can have freedom. He's the dog that is, you have to have your thumb on his pulse at all times. Right. And you're managing him and you're doing I'm, it. He's a management dog. Uh, he is not what I, I was. I, I had Nico. I was looking for <laughs> that such a balanced level head that could work, but could, you know, because I came from search dogs and I was missing that partnership. And that's what I had with Nico. And like me, I'm like, oh, every duchy is going to be this way. And, you know, I thought I was responsible. I went to a breeder who was pairing two dogs that came from such great kennel you know she did all these like desensitization tests you know when they're puppy day two you introduce this day you know i watched them grow up i truly believe the imprinting was there it was the wrong two dogs for whatever reason right. genetics didn't mesh well with these two dogs it also could have been in lilo and stitch with no problem <laughs> <laughs> yes but I'm you know surprised he we don't hear him uh, I'm, I'm out in the garage. So ah, that, yeah. gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, he is a management dog and that's the reality we have with him. He is a reason why we would introduce a lot more dogs to our pack, you know, right. is because it, we have to be fair to him. We have to be able to still have the time and dedication to him and his needs and not be selfish or, you know, and that's what a lot of people is they'll cut corners with management dogs. And that's when accidents happen. But, you know, the reality is, is that it's, it's just like having a special needs child, you know, yeah. you, you can't cut corners. You can't and expect results. Like I do not have expectations of this dog going out and being a demo dog, right. you know, those types of things. Like when we have photography and things like that done, he's not, we use a drone only, you know, because if they need to get pack work, because he's that volatile of like stimulus and just he's a dynamite. Mm -hmm. And so I think people need to see the difference. Is it reactivity? Is it aggression? Is it genetics? Yep. And, and, and then make it. Uh, and, and that's one thing I want Steve to talk about too is the difference between not just those three, but a lot of people think, oh, I have to be an alpha with my dog. Well, if your dog's a strong dog, guess what? You're going to be in a world of pain. You have to be mm -hmm. a, that leadership figure in that you guys do a lot of pack stuff. Your yeah. dogs have a pack amongst themselves. You were not a part of their pack. You have thumbs and you can stand up. You're mm -hmm. not a part of their pack. Um, and, and that's a big thing. I'm not a pack leader to my dog. If I tried to be alpha to Indy, that would be a bad day for me. Um, and it's Indy is a very calm, clear headed dog, but I, I kind of want to have him talk a little bit on, on that alpha versus leader mentality and then how you guys integrate that. Yeah. That like that, that's like a hot button for me yeah. because, and we're kind of the same. It's like, you want to use the most gentle influence on your dog as possible. Right. And the, just go ahead with that alpha thing, because that's just, well, you'll like this. So I was in a group class, um, doing the, uh, the, the first steps in our group class, which I, I like to do on occasion gets me connected with everyone still. And, um, it, it helps me just with that, that teaching thing. When we talk about being alpha, cause a lot of people think that they need to be alpha and I'll hear it oftentimes. I need to be more alpha. Um, that doesn't make sense. And I said, listen, you know, you're, th this right here makes you alpha. Um, you, you have opposable yeah. thumbs, you stand erect and, you know, that's your created alpha. You need to be a, a zookeeper. I said, but on the off chance that you want to be alpha with your dogs, 
then I want you to start walking around and peeing everywhere dogs have peed. Um, and make sure you do that in your front yard as well as your backyard uh, for all the dogs that have been passers by that have stopped and peed. And I said, then, and this was the, the kind of shocking thing. I said, then um, you've got to be willing to eat a baby um, uh, when, uh, when, when, when the baby's delivered and there's something wrong with it. And they yeah. looked at me and I was like, what? That, that's, that's what the alpha dog does. That's that. It's that's what the alpha does. does. Yeah, it, I just watched that, it happen like three days before that class. Um, yeah, uh, you know, where with, with a female giving birth, and then boom, um, uh, ate a stillborn uh, baby, and it. That's why I think that it triggered me to say that because you're going to be alpha. Yeah. That's you're going to instead be a zookeeper and be the best zookeeper through enrichment, through care. All the things that dogs need, leadership, uh, not you becoming overbearing and yeah. beating down on them. That's not what they need. And that's not how they're going to be, be or they're not going to respond well, at least 99% of the dogs. Yeah. Um, because once you take that away, all bets are off. Yeah. And once the next person comes along, um, that's not a heavy with those dogs, all bets mm -hmm. are off. And then they're going to want to challenge that person who's not a heavy that you go meet in the marketplace somewhere having a coffee um, and someone approaches and they don't have that same air about them. Now you have a dog who challenges them oftentimes. And then yeah. people are confused as to why. Um, it just, yeah, that's that's the way that I see it. And that's I, I'm not ashamed to explain it that way any longer. I'd yeah. say, you know, hey, go pee around your yard and maybe, you know, eat a, eat a dead baby. And alpha is and just you know people will say like in like my line i more so me because i don't do a lot of the you know reward based training like you guys do just because we're dealing with serious aggression and our our and reactivity and you can't stop that with a bag of treats i can't stop that because when we get these dogs people are like just you know do that well first if the dog is that and disengaged they're not using their nose nope. You can't, you know, that's like, it's not going to do anything. We just talked about this, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's just it, like a week ago. We just talked yeah. about, it. are you sure you can't just ignore them? Oh, no, that that's my favorite. If they're jumping, ignore them until they stop and then reward. Right. And, and that's what, that's what I was talking about. The same thing with that kennel. Why let them build the anxiety with a dog like a Dutchie or a Malinois or even with, with our German Shepherds, we see it a lot because, I mean, you know, Zeus, he's very yeah. high drive. Rock is very high drive. And, and if you yeah. just ignore those behaviors, and I always use the example of getting scars on your back. If Indy's a puppy and she's grabbing my calf with her mouth or Nico, is actually Nico is the one that did it. He was five weeks old and I walked in the puppy pen to play with him and he grabbed my calf and I just lifted my calf up and he's just hanging there. And I was like, oh my goodness. Um, and, and it's one of those things where people, well, it's just so cute. It's puppy mouthing. What that's happens that's when that dog is six months old and it's still doing it after that first 12 weeks, if it's still mouthing you, it's not puppy mouthing. They're trying yeah. to dominate you because you are giving up and, and, and acting like that mouth hurts. What happens when they want attention from brother, dad, mom, they want the toy over there. You're not giving them. They're going to use their mouth to get attention or if you're for instance the example i give a lot what if i have a tennis ball behind my back best example i give blue he'll come up and stare at me as a two-month-old puppy three-month-old puppy he'd be biting my legs yeah hey, let me have it let me have it let me have it there there's a difference what people don't understand is like you have to first stop the behavior that they're doing then teach them, then take that drive right. and put it where you want. Exactly. And so, and that's the difference, you know, it's, it's people are like, well, you're going to be mean if you do all these rules and structures and stuff like that. That's just the foundation. Yeah. Then we, then we layer back in the fun stuff. Exactly. Exactly. But you have to be able to, to stop that bad behavior because right. if you can't, how can you teach what is appropriate? Right. And that's what the people that I see a lot of the times are, well, so we, we talk about four tenets of leadership, food, feeding and nutrition. So food as a whole communication, oh, yeah. 
play and then rest. And people are like, well, what do you mean by play? What drives? You have to satisfy drives, right? Uh, um, again, I'm going to bring back in the Dutchies because they can be either very clear-headed or they're just a Malinois on steroids and crack, right? Uh, uh, because Kelso, he right. would be like in the line that I went with, I, it was supposed to be the calmer of the Dutchies, right? Oh man. But if he was truly put into, I think, a military regiment, right. like, a, oh my gosh, because when you put that dog to work, it, it's he, a different dog, right? It's a different dog, but his, his genetics are. Yes, his genetics are not for even an active family. Right, right. And, yeah. and that's one thing that I I will say, and I'll brag a little bit about the dog he picked out, India, is her her grand, great-grandparents and, and great-great-grandparents even were some of the top military and police dogs in the world, which, as people know, those dogs are batshit crazy. Um, yeah. And, and they're supposed to be. It's not that they're, oh, yeah. they're, they're, they're not they're, supposed they're to be. They're bred to do that. Right. But And then you get dogs out of that. And even her, I think it was her grandfather was, was Tommy. Um, and you get dogs out of that that are very clear-headed, that want to work when you tell them to. But then again, like you said, Nico, you could have them working balls to the wall and have that off switch, right? That's going to be a mm -hmm. big thing. Um, and, and the last thing I really want to talk about um, is going to be, again, we, we keep mentioning Dutchies, Malinois, German Shepherds. It's not just them. People no. do Dutchies, German Shepherds, Mal actually not so much Dutchies, but Malinois, German Shepherds, Pitbulls, uh, Connie Corsos, Presa Canarios, and all these dogs, aggressive dogs. No, they're not a lot of the time. 90% of the time, it's because of one, how they were raised. And then 10, mm -hmm. or I would say nine out of that last 10 is going to be simply what kind of training did you do? Did they have trauma in the past? Right. And then that 1% is genetics. Um, and, and you don't find that 1% very much, but the same thing happens with doodles. I tell people all the time, I've been bit by more doodles and poodles than I have any other dog. Oh, um, doodles. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so with your experience uh, and you owning German Shepherds and Dutch Shepherds and, and different, and you own all the way down to Chihuahuas, um, <laughs> which is labeled the most aggressive dog in the world by volume of bites. But what no, I have a dachshund too. And that one. Oh yeah. yeah. They're high up there too. And it's one of those things where you, you, it's all about how they're raised, right? You have oh, yeah. all of this different range of dogs and you see the difference in them because of how they're raised. How are people, and it's different, obviously, up here, even when we we're talking to Eric Stambro, he asked us, he's like, y'all probably get a lot of German Shepherds down there. And we we're like, no, doodles are our number one clients. Um, and, and he's like, well, German Shepherds are mine. And it's different everywhere. What is your number? I know you guys do a lot of reactivity training. What's your number one type of dog that you guys get? I, I, you know, honestly, here people get power breeds, German Shepherds. We get, believe it or not, Vizslas a lot, Rhodesian yeah. Ridgebacks, um, and then hunting dogs, the really drivey, you know, and then they, people don't understand the breed and how to harness their natural instincts, but in the positive way. Right. Through play. Yeah. Going back to like baggage, like, we, um, my dachshund, I inherited him when my mom passed, but the way he was raised, he was allowed to bite anyone. He couldn't be stopped. He's another management dog. Right. You know, he can be around people. He's not going to run up and bite them anymore. <laughs> but, you know, he's also, let's have realistic expectations on this dog. He's had 12 years of the habit of biting people, yep. running people off and just, you know, being a brat so you have to be realistic on they've had 12 years so that's how many thousands of repetitions of that right you know how many years it would take to untangle all that even a magician we can do it but it's over time you got to unravel all that stuff right and so it's just crazy the baggage that people get and not understand the full monty of what they have yeah um, and, and that's a, another thing I wanted to bring in is, um, and, and you can tell me what your opinion on this is. I see a lot of the times that anxiety driven dogs that happen to either be reactive or scared, they either have fight or flight, right? Um, and, and 
there, there a lot of those times, what doesn't matter what side of the spectrum they're on, they don't like to rest. And almost all the time, uh, their parents are like, well, I throw the ball for five or six minutes a couple of times a day, or I take the, I, the biggest one I get, well, I take her on three mile walks. That doesn't tire your dog's brain out. Um, and, and <laughs> no, we compare that to Chuck E. Cheese versus <laughs> piano lessons. There you you go. know, if you bring your dog or your kid home from Chuck E. Cheese, they've had all this like, ah, and they're going to be that way. And you're not going to get them to bed on time. Right. You take them home from piano lessons and they're just kind of like, I think I'm going to go to my room and, you know, right. There's a difference. And that's the, you know, even with like management dogs and people don't understand that when we talk about exercise, we talk about the brain, brain too. Yep. And that's just as important. You can physically wear them out, but mentally they're just going to still be kind of crazy cuckoo and ready to go. And that's like with Kelso, we have to physically work him and we have to mentally work him <laughs> with place and structure and rules. That's mentally working a dog. Right. Until he can have that, you know, balance, which he won't, that's something we'll always have to almost naturally, I mean, to force on him. We'll always have to force that calm on command, the, the lay down, that type of stuff. But it's just when people don't meet those needs, that's where reactivity comes from. That's where you see. And that's where the fear reactivity, a lot of times we'll get dogs, they'll come and they're barking at us and everyone's like, oh, they're alpha. They're, you know, every time they see someone, they're just, you know, rah, 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 and scaring them off. I'm like, no, that's not, that's fear. Yeah, that's right. When they say that, yeah, no, I'll bring in a, I'll bring a real alpha male in who's never been yeah. in a fight, um, who doesn't growl or bark at anyone, but he may roar in his chest as he walks through my daycare to break up the dogs that are humping um, and, uh, you know, in his chest and they look at him with these big eyes and they, whoop. he doesn't fight. He doesn't growl. He doesn't bark. He doesn't do anything. Uh, there's no cause for that. That's alpha. That is a real leader of a dog. And it's people that have a misconception of what alpha is. Yep. And um, it's, it, it, that's problematic. I mean, it truly is within the, in the dog side. When we talk about the the the, the fight or flight, mm -hmm. no, this is something that builds in reactivity um, because when we're on a leash, we can't run away. Um, and so you don't have to run. a human who does not have the skill set to deal with what's going on. So what is the dog going to do naturally? Mm -hmm. You force and me into fight, um, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, that's again, that goes back to where we opened. Reactivity is not aggression. Reactivity is reacting to, I'm stuck. Um, I, I'm stuck with you, is. unfortunately, and you're not doing anything about it. Yeah. So I'm a yeah, primal animal. I'm going to dig deep and I'm going to do what I know works um, and uh, I, give this a whirl. I, I feel like when dogs get stuck like that, because you see them mentally get stuck sometimes yeah. and you just have to move them and they reset. That puts them in one of the most primal states that they can go in. Absolutely. Because it's just their natural instinct kicks in and it's like almost, you can see it happen. It's just like they mm -hmm. get in that moment of like, I don't know what to do. So this is how reactivity starts. And it might not be a growl the first time, but you see those oh shit moments yeah. and you don't help them through it. Yeah. That's leadership, not alpha. That's the leadership we talk about. Right. Absolutely. The owners, you know, then they'll say, well, <clears throat> um, I've never seen them act like that before. Um, they've never probably been pushed uh, to that part of the threshold, right? Or they um, have, and they just didn't notice. The so they just didn't notice what was going on. Um, and I don't know that I like my dog anymore um, because mm -hmm. they didn't realize their dog was so aggressive. Um, it was so mean. How could my dog do that? It's my mm -hmm. baby. Um, mm -hmm. That becomes a big problem too, because um, they weigh out that what their dog really is. Well, when I, when I teach, I do a whole list of what a dog is and it's a primal animal. It's an apex predator. Um, mm -hmm. and so they see that and hear that right off the bat. 
whether they process immediately or not uh, is up to them, but uh, it is, it, it, it's a primal animal and it has to go primal at some point. If, if they don't step in and let mm -hmm. the dog know, Hey, yeah. you're safe in my world. You're, this is my world. I control this. I'm the human. You're safe in my world. Then it's definitely going to react, get labeled uh, as aggressive most of the time, as you know, because I'll oh, yeah. tell you, I, I'm sure that half the phone calls you get, my dog is, is aggressive and you work with the dog and see the dog is only leash reactive. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and so there's a big difference and a big divide in that, uh, or it has some barrier aggression. Sure, um, that's a reactivity, you know, place. Yeah. You know, it's, a, right. it's a restrainment, just like, you know, again, if you're training an attack dog, you restrain and build frustration. Same thing with barriers. Right. And people just, it, it's, it's a matter of just, it's reactivity, it's not aggression, yep. you know, but we, you can help with that. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to become, you know, what you need to be in a leader. And, and it's just, you know, alpha, the alpha thing just really gets me. Yeah. Because it, it really does. Because being a leader, sometimes you do have to have alpha moments. But, you know, I'm, I'm not an alpha at all. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a beta through and through. But I have to be alpha in moments for my dogs. Right. Like going back to the alpha, our Drake, he is my number one shepherd. Curtis has his, her, she's a working kind of like DDR lying German shepherd. So she, she is just, we love her. She's pushy. She's bratty. She's bitchy, but she can do dogs and puppies like nobody's business. Right. But my alpha dog, who is the true alpha of the pack, will just lay there and dogs will line up to just stick their head in his face. <laughs> right. Because that's an alpha and the wolves, you know, they lick the teeth and, you know, that's a sign of, sign of respect. You know, he doesn't do anything. Like, I don't, he doesn't even pay attention to dogs. So it's just being an alpha is being different than being a leader. Curtis's right. dog, Phoenix is a leader. I'm going to coach you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, walk you through this drake could care less yeah but i would rather be with phoenix than drake if it's me you know and that's how dogs look at it too mm -hmm. well where's curtis hiding speaking of curtis he is hiding in the house he, <laughs> he will not do these he's like if someone paid me ten thousand dollars i might do one <laughs> he just does not do this he doesn't he's dying to come up and see you though meet you yeah, I need to come up. Yeah, um, we'll, have, we'll have a good time. Um, one last question I want to have uh, um, regarding that we keep mentioning the word aggression. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not really touching on it. There are dogs that have true aggression. Uh, yes. There's true, what I call a lot of time, well, just basically with what I, I deal with here, true aggression versus fear aggression, which is obviously uh, a little bit different. And both can cause reactivity. Um, yes. Where is that fine line when you see the, the two um, side by side? Where's the fine line of fixable versus management? Because sometimes that true aggression isn't necessarily genetics, but it's because of, of the fact that it has what's called false dominance. Yeah. Um, and, and it thinks- Those it, are the most dangerous. Right, and they, they absolutely are. Um, and, and even because they're not scared of anything, mm -hmm. um, so much so that I've had dogs try to attack Indy and get this close to her face and mm -hmm. she wouldn't move. And then it changes their mindset. And now they're fine with every dog just by my dog, not moving um, because they, realize they, they can't use their mouth to win everything. Right. But what mm -hmm. is, what is that fine line that you guys see with true aggression versus fear aggression and, and management versus fixability? To me, true aggression, I usually see comes out in humans, like, aggressive towards humans right um so when a dog is willing no matter what kind of leader it has to try to attack you and bite you that's aggression right i say that that's like one percent of dogs that are labeled aggressive are true aggression they either have fear you know aggression they have reactivity that's really strong and it's mislabeled True aggression to me is not fixable. 
it's almost that conversation of let's have some realistic expectations here. If you're okay, if the dog's okay with you and you not having people come over, you know, you can't take the dog out because it's a liability. Like, and they're like, you wouldn't even take it on a walk. No, I wouldn't. Right. The Rottweiler I text you about. Yes. Yes. There's, there's dogs out there like that. Yeah. But you know, it's pretty clear once you get hands on with them, the difference, um, whether it's just some dogs are labeled aggression and they're just truly alpha dogs that don't want to be told what to do and has never had anyone, you know, stand their ground. Though, you know, those to me are kind of, man, the ones that are truly think they're false dominant, that are false dominant or true dominant assholes that, you know, have been able to get away with any type of biting or anything like that. Those are the dangerous ones. Those are, I take your aggression all day long. I'll take shut down all day long. You give me that one. I'm like, Curtis, no back off. I'm no. Well, that's when Curtis comes in and doesn't talk to the dog and just. He doesn't, you know, that's one thing that like, he's always like, you talk to the dogs too much. You talk to the dogs too much. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm sorry. (laughs) He like his thing, his whole thing is the relationship with you have with your dog shouldn't be built on commands. It shouldn't be built on voice. They should be so in tune with you when you move, they're already in the heel. They're already, it's not, you know, come on, let's go. I mean, we do that more for humans, I think, right? Than we do for the dogs. Because it's like when we when we teach place, we use the word pizza, chicken, you know. The dog doesn't care. It's your intention that you put behind that word. Right. And so, you know, I just, it's fun training dogs that way. It just not take Curtis challenges me all the time. Don't, don't talk to the dog. He's like, watch if I go in and I baby talk, cause our kennel room, is just like usually aggressive, reactive dogs. He's like, if you go in there and baby talk one dog, I'm guaranteeing you that other dog's going to react to you. And nine times out of 10, it does. Right. Nine times and people are like you don't you know i guess encourage baby talk you don't encourage the excitement i'm like we do after we can get the dog balanced right after we can balance them out then yes. you can add in the excitement you can add in but if you say say take nico you could immediately install that because he was a balanced puppy right A lot of people don't come to us with balanced dogs and, you know, they're like, you're being mean to my dog. You told my dog, no, you know, but I'm like, until you balance them, then, you know, then you can bring back freedom. You can bring back rewards. You can bring back this, but it's your intention behind the free, you know, the freedom, the rewards. Is it easy? And they're peeing and pooping all over the house. The rewards, are you giving it to them because they look cute and you want them to dance, you know? urine nutrition nine times out of ten when we have dogs that are stomachs are messed up it's because they're feeding they're like oh this is really good food but yeah you're feeding a pound of treats for no reason to this dog that looks like love yes and that is not love 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 to me is like i remember when i was a kid and my parents had rules structure discipline and I got scared and I had a nightmare. I wanted to go crawl in bed with my parents, not my sister, you know? And so, yeah, my sister loved me, but my parents loved me enough to put that structure in my life that I knew that no matter what happened, I could go to them in a fearful moment and they take care of it. I go right to sleep. Sure, sure. And it's kind of like the dogs coming up on the sofa and stuff like that. Um, Like you lounge with your dogs, but they're balanced. And there's where the difference lies. Um, and uh, so for me, I tell people, get your dog off the sofa, get 100%. your dog off the bed. Um, there's a time that you can bring that back. It happens in my house. I'm not going to sit and say it never happens because it does. Um, uh, it does. And I enjoy it, but the dogs don't love it. Um, they, they, that's a human taught behavior. Yes. Right. Uh, and we teach them as puppies when they first come home oh i want you to love me we try to teach them love all the wrong ways because we want to be accepted by them yeah but 
you know, it, I think of like those freedoms of getting up on the couch and stuff. It's fluid. It's it's very fluid. Yeah. My dogs dictate the the rewards that they get, and to me, rewards are freedom. You know, getting on the furniture, being included in different things. Like inclusion is the biggest thing for a dog. Yes. And a reward so when they're good they get they are included to go out and take trash out with me because they're in a clear state they're you know they can go out front and not run off i don't have to worry about it right. but if if i have a dog that's not balanced if i open the door boom they're gone like i would never let my my dachshund out in the front yard right because he's just he's cuckoo for cocoa puffs i accept it you know it's okay that's you know you work with what you get and then you you build a plan around it. He's right. just one of these dogs. Can I walk him on a leash? Yeah. But I like to have that lifestyle of my dogs included in everything we do. And I know you guys are too. If I go outside, I want them to go out with me. I, but is it going to cause a dog fight? Well, you know, we got to do things different. And I think that, that people don't understand that if your dog had two good weeks and then has a bad day, it's a bad day, you know instill a little bit more for you know structure and stuff in them for a couple days and then they can earn that freedom back yep. right you have to pair back the the freedom at the same time you're doing a little bit more instruction yes. you know, i'll go out and sit on my deck with three dogs and um uh that's our time to relax and play and have them included with us right we're going to watch the sunset we're going to sit there relax at the end of the day talk but when they when they're not doing what they should do, we may tell one of them, hey, go over there and lay down. Exactly. And they hands are off and go lay down. And the other two are little angels. And um, uh, that's th the other one lives, sits there and watches. Like, I want to yeah. be over there with you. And once a little bit of time has passed um, and things have settled with the other two who were, you know, being, you know, pretty good, then I'll call the other one over. Hey, come on over here and you see a change in demeanor um they are they want the love they want to do it on my terms and that's i think a lot of people miss that too because it's just like you said the wrong love uh unearned affection and and, mm -hmm. and that's a big problem is unearned affection and and people are they're weird about that because they don't understand what yeah how could you not love them so i'm going to pose this to you so one of the things that's been just eating at me lately is I see posts about dogs um, and they'll use a whiny, silly, dumb voice for their dog. I call that baby talk. Yeah. It's, it's the, but it's worse than baby talk. It is. Oh, the yeah. Baby it's talk just ever. made to just amp them up. Well, no, not talking to oh. their dog, talking as if they were their dog. Oh. You know what I'm okay. talking about? Um, yeah. But then they'll, t they'll then talk to you about how intelligent their dog is. Mm -hmm. Oh, my dog is so smart. My dog is brilliant. My dog is this, my dog. And I'm like, you just posted a video acting as if your dog was the dumbest creature on the planet. Mm -hmm. And now in the next breath, so which is it? Can you balance reality and mm -hmm. this fantasy about your dog so that you can have a, and I'll use your term, the, a balanced dog? And mm -hmm. I think that's where a lot of people struggle. Um, yeah. because they want that one side. Um, but then they also want to believe that their dog is the smartest creature on the planet. And you're going to be somewhere in between there in what reality looks like. I have some goofy dogs at home. I, I really do. They're, they're silly. They toss a toy and play with themselves. And then they grab the toy again and throw it as if they've never thrown a toy in their life before yep. when they're amazed that it just went up in the air the way it did or bounced the way it I did. have one like that. He'll play with himself for an hour. Just he's and happy he, these are intelligent dogs but i would never make a video and make them sound like a complete imbecile um, by dubbing a voiceover uh for them um, or writing something out uh that that just sounds like they're a complete imbecile um, mm -hmm. but i also know they're only so intelligent you know they have the brain of a toddler um and uh, their drives make them who they are and, mm -hmm. and everything else is, is around that but yeah, that has really, really irked me lately because I see a lot. And I think maybe going into Christmas, we see more because people are trying to hustle um, uh, 
program. Brent logs or they're trying to get rid of rescues and get puppies out there and all that stuff. And so you see an increase in that. And it really bugs me because people aren't really sure what to think. And, and they're told, hey, this is a very smart dog. But then it acts, you know, you, you do these little words. And I, I just want to see balance. Just see normalcy, I think, is, yeah. is more for me is what I like to see with animals me too. Uh, in, in our homes and even working, just normalcy um, and let a dog yeah. be a dog. And, and that's just it. That's what, you know, people, back to socialization, people think dog parks should be running and playing and, you know, all this stuff. But socialization is a dog being, being able to do natural dog behavior, sniff, you know, urinate, defecate, you know, but if you watch a dog in the backyard, they're not doing zoomies, you know, eight hours a day. They're just a squirrel, you know, uh, sure. someone will die. So they catch a, a whiff of it. Right. That is socialization. Exactly. That is what Being okay in that environment right. of change. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, people are all the time, they have this such a big misconception and they'll bring us a dog, reactive dog, and we'll put them in our pack of about eight to 10 dogs. And they're like, but they're not running and playing. I'm like, but you're missing the point. And people think and associate happiness and healthy as running playing a tail wagging excited you know but it's the opposite the most balanced dogs you you know they have those moments but for the most part it's kind of like people they're like us we walk around normal most of the time do we get excited yes when we, we see someone we might get a little excited give them a hug or something but then we conversate right. we're not it's the same thing with dogs and that's what the expectation should be instead of you know running and playing you know tackling each other that's good and there's moments of that right. but that is not the expectation and that shouldn't right. be the rule the rule should be a calm relaxed dog that can do anything in any environment walk outside you know isn't so stressed out but knows exactly where their handler is because it's just that connection and that relationship yeah agreed agreed well i think that I've covered everything I want. Is there anything else you want to touch on? Um, I would just ask, Merit, what in in summing up um, the uh, the problems with the reactive dogs? What is one thing? Uh, I know I have a key thing that I teach people with puppies, um, mm -hmm. um, and it's actually it, it, I'm doing this seminar, the Santa Paula seminar, uh, coming up soon. But uh, what's one thing that you teach people? when they say when they go home with that reactive dog because right. you've put in the work you've done all the things now you've transferred to them and translated to them what is one thing that you tell them when they go home um to always be doing always uh be aware of always be watchful of with that dog going home what's something that you that you really that is something that you do over and over and over regardless of the owner regardless of the dog uh, when you have those reactive dogs well, instructions in going home, Yeah, we, we tell them that the dog needs to have a leash on them no matter what throughout the house, unless they're in a kennel or, you know, you can't keep your eyes on them because the big key to me is the clear communication and direction. Right. And that's what people are missing. And that, those are the moments. So they'll go home and they'll take the tools that we helped to give them to aid in the relationship just to bridge the gap between dog and human, they'll take that out. So it's back to foreign language and frustration. Sure. So my thing is keep a leash on your dog so that if you say, hey, Fido here, and they don't, it's not a debate. Right. You're removing the debate because you can reel your dog in, you know, whether you have to catch them or, or whatever, but it helps take the frustration out especially with fearful, nervous, shut down dogs that are reactive, you know, that are fearful, they, they might bolt for some reason, have a leash on them so that you can guide them without frustration. Right, we actually have, use the same thing, go ahead. And I was just gonna say, and also don't start a walk at like, a lot of people will just go out on a walk. I say, take 10 minutes in your driveway, parking lot, wherever, and get that dog focused in on you. If you cannot be more important in the environment in a familiar place that they should be, you know, accustomed to, you're never gonna, you're setting yourself up to fail. Yeah. 
Yeah. You go out on the walk and you, the chances of you raining that dog in is you might as well just let it loose. Flooded out there on the walk. Absolutely. For sure. yeah. 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 They have. And so I, that's my, and people are like, well, what if you don't get, I don't go on a walk. Yeah. I would rather have, that. I would rather have quantity than quality because a lot of people will be like, yeah, I'll walk my dog three times a day. And how many times did your dog react? Oh, about 22. Well, if you had built the relationship in the driveway and had a positive experience and, you know, I love positive experiences with your dog. I would rather you sit in the driveway and be okay than to go walk around the block and have no control over your dog. Right. Yep. Right. So we teach those them. are two exactly. biggest things I would say. Yeah. When we send a dog home, uh, we, uh, we tell them they should be crated for three days. Um, mm -hmm. so that they understand there's rules and confinement and, and just going home. So it's not the run around, go back mm -hmm. in. And if they're not in the crate, they're on leash with you. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, for the exact same reason, because there's rules, there's boundaries. Um, it's, it's, you know, then it has to be about accountability. If you mm -hmm. ask for it, it, it has to be expected that it's done. Right. So yeah. uh, exactly the same thing. And I think that it works well. So, and I love the idea. Like I'll tell people, walk out your front door, have a, have your dog do a sit, focus on you, walk to your driveway, do a sit or a down, do the same thing at the end of the driveway. One of the things that I do is I tell them, if you're used to walking down the driveway and turning right for your walks, start Take turning left, left um, yeah. you know, and uh, change familiarity with the dog because they become too routine and pattern. Um, and that empowers them to then uh, yeah. uh, be more reactive if they've had issues. So um, yeah, we, we do so many of the same things. I love what you guys do. I wish Curtis would put his mug on the TV with us. I know. I know. I'm maybe one day we can, I hope maybe so. when he gets up here, when you guys come up here, we'll, 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 we'll get into our yeah. setting up here and we'll, we'll sneak him in and Not at least sure. get him to do a cameo and a walk by and a <laughs> wave or something. You know how hard it is for me to get pictures of him or video of him working. At That's what I was telling him. He'll stop working dogs if I pull out the video. Like, just, <laughs> it's like I have to be like behind bushes sometimes and, you know, catch him in the right mood That's because he's just like, I don't need that distraction. He's like, you're bringing in an unnatural behavior into a situation <laughs> when I'm trying to teach a dog a natural behavior. It's oh, not right. So He's like, that's not fair to the dog. It's not fair to me. I'm like, okay, but but nowadays, you know, people want to see their dogs, and uh -huh. you know, and he's like, <sighs> <laughs> you have to he's get gotten better hat. about it, huh? You may have to get him a GoPro hat or a GoPro chest X thing that he can just wear, you know? You know, he said if I got him like the drone that follows you, he would oh like yeah, that. those are cool. Yeah, so maybe, but you know, <laughs> that's too funny. Uh, yeah. That's funny. I'll let Tanner wrap up, but thank you for being on with us. You know, I love you. I can't wait to see you guys. I appreciate what you guys are doing in the dog world. Oh, uh, you too. It's uh, it's much, much needed to, to just have real training and then being able to speak with people on a real level and not sugarcoat and not lie to them um, and have real expectations of them, not just what we can do for their dogs. So I appreciate what you guys are doing. Tell Curtis I said, hey. I, w I would love to have the discussion one day about service dogs. Oh, oh yeah. Hey, let's plan it and do it because obviously let's do that's, it. Because that's do it. the rise of people needing service dogs now is just, it's crazy. There's people that need them, yeah. but people yeah. are also not doing training and they don't understand. And I think that's a topic that needs to be talked about a lot more is i'll tell you what you get a list of questions and we'll do like a q a and i can answer them and that'll lead into everything um do that and i would love to do it yeah yes let's do it i just you know because it comes into like picking the right puppy you can't just go rescue a dog that has baggage and that's what we're seeing a lot of i have this dog it's two and i'm like okay i just yeah. That's not, that could be emotional support dog, but. The there, chances of it different. becoming a service dog are slim. Right. Yeah. And what people don't understand is the money that's involved and the time that's involved. And yeah. so why would you spend that amount of money and time into a dog that I would say with 95% chance of flunking out, 
But you can't do that in a one month board and train? Are you sure? Oh gosh, no. I can't do that in an eight week board and train. What are you talking about? I need a guy that. named Steve and what's up dog because that's where I send them because it, it's, it's not, it's foundational, it's relationship, it's months and months and, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. sorry. It's a long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll talk about more on that uh, next time we do one of these. Okay. Um, last thing I always ask is what do you guys have coming up with Calm Canine? And I know we talked a little bit about it, but uh, if you want to share, share what you guys have coming up, uh, if you guys are transitioning to do one thing or the other, or if you guys are doing uh, anything new, crazy marketing wise, what, what do you guys got going on? Well, right now we're kind of been in the, the midst of changing a couple of things. We're excited because we finally have gotten, I guess, more of an aftercare. Because one of the problems we've seen, and I'm sure you guys see it, the dogs go home. And even if they have free follow-ups, no one ever contacts you until there's a problem. Right. So we have a lot of automation set up for following up and checking in with the clients more. Cause you know how it is you get busy with dogs you get your day-to-day -day, and unless you hear something sometimes you don't think about following up right. so we're we've really spent about six months delving into the automation of you know three days after they go home they get an email checking in and so on right. and things like that and then right now we're giving a free a board and train giveaway um for and we do that randomly just for people that are struggling they can't afford us sometimes yeah so. absolutely awesome well and it, what's you guys' uh, your website and, and social media just real quick, and we'll go ahead and close out. Okay. Um, for our website, it's thecalmcanine.com. And for our Instagram and TikTok, it's the calm underscore canine. Perfect. Awesome, y'all. Well, thank you for being on. It's been a lot of fun. I We had our back-end trainer sitting to the side, and, and we when I went out to use the restroom, she came out there, and she was like, I learned a lot of things I did wrong with my first dog before I came to y'all. Oh, and, cool. and it was a really cool thing to hear. I was like, yeah, they're, they're good at what they do. That's why we when we're full, we can't do reactive dogs because we are at almost max capacity, which when we have only one or two slots left in our board and train program at our facility, we, we won't take any reactive dogs for those two slots. We'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and in those cases we will, but most of the time yeah. we won't or if we're two months out and this dog's a month from being euthanized, we'll call and, and, and send them down to y'all. And so that's, it's, it's really nice to have good contacts that teach the same yeah. way we do, because there's a lot of people that we're the, like, like you were saying, we're the only people that don't prioritize using uh, uh, aversive methods in training. And that, that's us too. We're in one of the few in Orlando or in central Florida that, you know, we use, you know, certain tools, but we don't go to like remote callers. Well, there's, I mean, there's, there's a time and a place, right? Yeah, and, and for the average dog or reactive dog or family pet, a remote caller is not going to fix the it's issue. Not the way. Right, exactly. And I think that's where a lot of people are, are misconstrued with that. But thank you guys for being on. Uh, um, Steve had to run real quick. He's got to deal with puppies. Uh, but, um, but thank you for being on. Uh, everybody look for this podcast on YouTube, Spotify, um, and Apple Podcasts. And um uh, like I said, I can't, I can't thank you guys enough for being on. It's been wait. a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely.